All right, let's look at verse 9. It says right here, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So notice right here that Paul's saying, if you have a little bit of leaven, what's going to happen? It's going to leaven, it's going to rise up into a whole lump. That's what you see with bread, right? Yeast, etc. So Paul is saying right here that this persuasion, this belief of going back to Ju Judaism as mandatory is that little leaven. And what's going on is the church, which is unleavened bread, the church is not leaven, okay? The church is unleavened bread. That's why during the Lord's Supper, what do we eat? We eat unleavened bread. It's not leavened. But see, when you put a little bit of leaven right here, what happens? It becomes a lump after that. It looks like Tom's bread that he brings all the time at church. That's what happens. So what you got to understand right here is that this is likened to sin, leaven. We're going to look at the book of 1 Corinthians, please. Chapter 5. First Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 8. In the Bible, we know that leaven is likened to sin. That turns into lump. So we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 5. It's all a spiritual application here. A spiritual application. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. See, that's Paul's favorite saying. You'll notice that throughout his writings. That's his favorite saying. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Okay, what did you mean by that, Paul? Look at verse 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. There's something about our leaven that's old. That's referring to our old nature, our fleshy nature, the old man, the sinful nature here. Let's keep reading. The Bible says that ye may be a new lump as ye are what? Unleavened. See, the church is supposed to be unleavened bread here. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither... So what is this old leaven? Neither with the leaven of what? See that? It's spiritual. Malice and wickedness. See? It's representing sin. Leaven represents sin. But what does unleaven represent? but with the unleavened bread of what? Sincerity and truth. So unleavened bread is supposed to represent the opposite of sin. It's supposed to represent something holiness. It's supposed to represent truth. Remember what Paul said, who did hinder you? That you should not obey the truth. That's why he says later on, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, because the unleavened bread is the truth that you were diverted away from. Okay, let's look back to our main text. Let's return to our main text. By the way, this is a very good passage that you can use on your Catholic friends that the wafer you're eating is not supposed to be Jesus Christ. It's supposed to be me. So you're actually eating me if you believe in that literally, that you're eating the flesh and blood of me. You might, they might get confused. Because the Bible says that the unleavened bread is supposed to represent the church. It's supposed to represent the church. You know why Jesus said the unleavened bread is his body? Because the church is his what? The body. Oh. So you can tell your Catholic friend, if you believe in that literally, then you're eating me right now. That's what you're doing. So that's what you can point out to them. So those Catholics are not just picking being cannibals on just Jesus' body. They're universal cannibals. They're eating everybody right here, all kinds of different humans. So that's why it's important to understand that you got to look at Scripture with Scripture. And some of these doctrines, that's why you'll realize how false and how much in error they are. That's actually to the point of ludicrousy. Okay, so let's look at uh, Galatians chapter 5 again. Verse 10. Ah, I forgot. Uh, Matthew 13. This is a more important passage. Go to Matthew 13, please. Matthew 13. 
Now, there are a lot of Christian scholars who get this interpretation wrong, okay? This one, you don't want to be as dumb, dumb as them, please. This is a parable about Jesus, from Jesus about the woman who puts uh, some sort of leaven in the bread when she cooks the bread. And then when this bread uh, grows out, a lot of dumb preachers think, oh, that's the church in a positive sense becoming great and prosperous. Why that's, why that's uh, bull? Because if you look at the passage, if you put leaven in the bread, the church, that's supposed to be something negative, right? So that's what that woman is supposed to represent in the parable. So look at the parable about the woman, okay? Look at Matthew chapter 13. We'll look at verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the what? Whole was leavened. Now, do you remember that wording back at the book of uh, Galatians? A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now, do you think that's a positive thing then, or is that a negative thing, if you look at that? It's negative, right? So what this is supposed to represent is not the church growing into prosperity, but the church growing into sin. That's why it makes sense those big, prosperous churches are so much filled with sin. Because they think that parable is a church representing something prosperous. Yeah, we agree with that, but that's in a negative way, not in a positive way. It's supposed to represent more fleshiness, more sin. It's not, the, it's not supposed to symbolize or represent the growth of the church being mighty and prosperous and we bring in the kingdom of God on earth. No, that's not what it's supposed to represent. In the end, you're bringing in the Antichrist. That's what all churches will do at the end. It'll do a one world religion. And that's what's going on right now. All right, let's look back to our main text. Galatians chapter 5 verse 10, please. Galatians chapter 5 verse 10. I have confidence in you through the Lord. So Paul has a lot of confidence in his people through God's power. God, uh, he trusts in God that he will be able to have confidence and no worries with his own people. On what? That ye will be none otherwise minded. So these Galatians will not be minded by the Judaizers. They're not going to be influenced by the Judaizers. That's what Paul's confident about. But he that troubleth you shall bear his iniquity, uh, shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. What does that mean? That means that whoever of these guys are troubling the Galatians, Paul surrenders it to the hand of God that they will bear their judgment. God's going to get them, whoever they are. So in reality, actually, uh, it's really sad, a lot of pastors cannot say that for Galatians 5.10. Can your pastor honestly say that about you, that I don't worry about whoever these heretics are trying to steal you guys, because I, I have confidence you're going to be fine. I have that much confidence in you. And you're not going to be minded by these heretics right over here. And I know for a fact that the guys, these heretics who are influencing you, they will bear their judgment. And you know what? That's my case with my church, to be honest. If I go to Visitation Street preaching, you know, I see Brother Jack and Brother Tom, you know, getting pressured by this woman who's into the Bhagavad Gita, you know, stuff like that. Sean's like so excited. He wants to talk to them. He's like looking at me all giddy. I was like, ah, leave them alone. They'll be fine. You know, let them sweat it out. They'll be fine. You know, do I get worried? No, I don't get worried about it. You know why? Because I know that they've been grounded enough. I have that much confidence in them. Same thing with online. When those heretics, they try to get on me, and they're like trying to put me as some kind of crazy, heretical dispensationalist, I go like this. Oh, they're going to bear their judgment, whoever they are. Now, you've been with me for one to two years. You've seen how God dealt with my enemies, right? God took care of them all right. I didn't have to do a thing. So I was like, oh, I'm, I have confidence, you know, they'll be fine. The Lord will take care of them. If anyone was foolish or dumb enough to follow the heretics, then they're not going to listen to what I say. See, so whatever they deserve, they're going to get it, to be honest. That's what the Lord will give to every person. If a person really wants the truth, God will make sure they deserve the truth. If a person wants to stick to his own bias and lie and is dumb enough to do it, then the Lord will give them what they deserve. So see, I don't get worried about that. So I'm like, oh, so then 
don't you get worried about these heretical internet channels? No, they're going to bear their judgment, whoever they are. Their time will come. And you know what? The Lord did that every time. Every time. He never failed. So I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. I mean, if you have 141,000 subscribers online, I think I'm doing okay. You know? I think I'm doing fine. <laughs> See, the Lord will take care of everything for you. The Lord will take care of everything for you. I just surrender. Coming here in San Francisco Bay Area, don't you think that I have every reason to worry about, you know, do you know how much it costs to rent a place, to get your own building? And then how, how often do you think you can persuade people to come to church in this liberal area? How do you work with them? I don't worry. The Lord will take care of it. Okay, let's look at Galatians chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 11. And I, brethren, so Paul's talk, calling the Galatians his brethren. He's also saying about me, I, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? So Paul's giving this question here. He's arguing right here. If I'm, if I'm preaching in a way that will sympathize with the Judaizers about circumcision, then why do I suffer persecution? That's his reason. Why is he suffering persecution if he's not in the right concerning circumcision? Okay, so let me repeat that. So let's, right here, Paul was against circumcision, right? What he preached about circumcision is considered by these Judaizers to be wrong. That's what they're thinking in their minds. But Paul's arguing right here, if what I preach about circumcision is wrong then, then why am I suffering persecution? That's one of the reasons why you know you're living in the right is when you're being persecuted. How do you know that what you're preaching is right, preacher? Because of the persecution that you go through. If I have everybody loving me, then I know I'm in the wrong. If I have someone calling me the America's number one preacher, Will's beloved preacher, who smiles in front of the magazine face, then you know I'm in the wrong. So I'm sorry, I'm not like Joel Osteen. I'm not T.D. Jakes. I'm not like those guys. Why? Because if I am like that and I don't suffer persecution, I am in the wrong. So that's Paul's reasoning right here. So if you're suffering persecution, church, that's not something where you should be discouraged in. That's something you should be encouraged that I must be doing something right. So when the enemies attack us, sure, I mean, it's a natural response to sometimes get discouraged, sometimes get a little fearful. But to me, honestly, overall, I know that I'm in the right and it fires me up even more. Fires me up even more. Why? Because I know that I'm doing what's right in the eyes of God. That's why the Bible says in 2 Timothy, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus, if you're in the right, shall what? Suffer persecution. Quick story. Wesley, he thought that he was sinning, he was backsliding, because he didn't get any persecution that day. So he begged to the Lord in prayer, Lord, please, I want persecution. And then some guy threw a brick at John Wesley, and it almost could have uh, hit him and injured him. It slightly missed him. John Wesley looked at that and he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Thank you, Lord. You know, that should be the attitude. All right, let's go back to Galatians chapter 5. And we've gotten very Laodicean. We're not Philadelphian like back then. And these stories of these people put you under conviction. Verse 11. The second part of verse 11. Then is the offense of the cross ceased. So then what he's preaching about the cross would stop, it would cease concerning its offense. So, this is all, why are you being persecuted? Because it's offensive. Ah, then you know you're in the right. How do you know you're in the right in street preaching? How do you, how do you know you're in the right when you're preaching a sermon and somebody walks out? How do you know that you're in the right when somebody yells at you when you witness to them the gospel? Because it offends them. And then I get persecuted for that. So, hooray, I'm in the right. That's the idea. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to act like a jerk with everybody and deliberately pick fights. You can honestly tell when a person's trying to pick a fight and a person who's being sincere with the truth. There's a difference with that. Sincere, because remember, all of this is in line with what? The truth of the gospel. So, the idea is this, is that if you get, if you, if you, what you say offends people and you get persecuted and you're going by the sincerity of the gospel, Hey, praise the Lord. 
Praise the Lord. Don't, don't, don't cry out in church, oh, I'm being persecuted, please pray for me. We all might go like this and say, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus. No, nah, we won't do that. <laughs> we won't do that. That'd be, that'd be kind of mean. So in prayer meetings, obviously, we sympathize with you. If you're going through a persecution, of course, we sympathize and uh, pray for you. We had people here whose families persecuted them. That's not something to rejoice about. But to be quite honest, and if you're so spiritual in Jesus Christ, you should be happy. It should be a time in church where we're not like going, oh, I'm so sorry, brother. It should be, praise the Lord, brother. That's how it should honestly be. All right, go to Galatians 5. We'll look at verse 12. I would, they were even cut off, which trouble you. Oh, wow. So Paul's saying right here, he, if he had it his way, I would. See, if he had it his way. If, it, if I had it my way, that they would be cut off, that God would cut them off, those who trouble them. So it is a tendency, which is very true, a tendency of preachers who work so hard. Preachers work so hard. They labored so hard to do this, to do this with their people. This is their people. Preachers are working in their people to do this, establish in this fact. But then here comes these knuckleheads, these so-and-so come in, hinder them, steal them, and bring them to their heresy. And the tendency of preachers is, I wish that they were to be cut off. I wish I would that they were cut off. And yes, what ticks your pastor off more than anything, you know what it is, right? It is when some, some so-and-so out there deceives some innocent soul with heresy and steals them away. You want to see me angry? That's what makes me angry. And you've seen me angry in teaching before. You don't want to make me angry. <laughs> That's what ticks me off more than anything. One thing that you get on me, it's another thing when you damage a soul. His eternal reward, his, his or her eternal state. You're going to tick me off more than anything. And I, that's the tendency of preachers, see. They wish that they would be cut off. But, like Paul said in the, in the verse 10, in verse 10, God's going to be the one that judges them. See, I don't have to do it. The Lord's going to take care of it. But there is this side to me. I, I would that they were cut off if I had it my way. Do I still think that way? To be honest, yeah. That's why you'll notice uh, when people think that I'm hateful and mean, you don't understand what this is. You really don't understand what this is. Why would I be mean? Why would I be angry? Why would I be sarcastic? Because you're talking about you're ruining the eternity of a person's soul. And if that person's soul is saved, you're still ruining his, you're still ruining his lifetime as well as his eternity of what he'll be rewarded from God. That ticks me off more than anything. I will stomp on you. I will show you no mercy. Period. And that includes independent fundamental Baptist pastors. In this video, I'm not going to name names. Uh, later on, you've heard me mention a few names before. But th that includes the IFB pastors. They always try to criti They act like they're so smart. Well, I'm smarter than... And they'll name certain Bible-believing preachers. They'll critique certain Bible-believing people. Oh, you know, Dr. Ruckman. You know, yeah, he's a great man. But blah, 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 blah. You know, that, that ticks me off. That shows that this guy... He, he didn't know anything until he studied Ruckman stuff. And then he picks and chooses what he likes is better. And he says, but you know, this looks better. Why? Because he wants to look like a respectable pastor. And then these dumb people, they say, oh, what a great preacher. What a great teacher he is. You don't fool me. I've grown up in IFB churches all my life. All my life. And I've been through different camps all my life. You don't fool me. Okay, so that's the bad side of your pastor. Okay? So you, you see what gets on my dark side. Okay? That's, uh, let me justify myself one more time here. So what made Jesus Christ more upset than anything? Was it the prostitutes, the publicans, or was it people like religious leaders? Okay, now you think and pray about that, okay? Because, see, we take spiritual life very seriously. That's what angers us even more than anything, is when you take spiritual life seriously.